there really are people who want to do mass murder attacks against Americans who we cannot always uh, convict in a criminal court with all the due process attendants that, uh, uh, that, uh, that obtain there. Uh, and as a result, you have to either release those people or hold on to them. And President Obama decided he needed to hold on to them, no matter what his values were at the time that he made that statement. Uh, and as far as Abu Ghraib is concerned, that was not an interrogation issue. That was, uh, you know, that was a number of people who were renegade troops, which can happen under any circumstances. That was not part of any interrogation program was not under any interrogation protocol that the United States has ever had. So it was a smear of what the CIA did uh, in what I think was an honorable effort and a successful effort to glean uh, or to obtain life-saving intelligence, which really did save hundreds if not thousands of American lives. To smear that by throwing the layer of Abu Ghraib on top of it, and, and this is what the Obama left does, is just outrageous, um, and it had nothing to do with uh, with any interrogation program. It had nothing to do with anybody's values. And as far as the stupidity of, um, you know, this that isn't uh, counterterrorism; it's a recruitment tool. First of all, nobody ever prescribed it as any kind of counterterrorism. But let's let's agree with the president just for argument's sake, and say that. That was a regular American uh, interrogation process, which, which we all know that it was not. Was, would that recruit a sensible person into an enterprise that's about mass murder? No sensible person would go into mass murder or be recruited into mass murder over that. That's preposterous. I mean, we've seen all sorts of things where Americans get abused uh, and, America, and America itself uh, gets gets held up as uh, as an example of all kinds of disgraceful stuff, and it doesn't move us to become mass murderers. Uh, the fact of the matter is, whether they want to come to grips with it, uh, with it or not, the the recruitment tool is the ideology of Islamic supremacism, which dehumanizes non-Muslims and those who then become indoctrinated in this ideology. Uh, something that would be inconceivable to us, namely the mass murder of innocent people, uh, be becomes something that's acceptable uh, when you're within the grip of that ideology. Now, you know, they can talk about all sorts of things. They can talk about Guantanamo Bay. They can talk about Israel. They can talk about, uh, you know, who's, who's burning a Koran today or who's making a cartoon of Muhammad today. Uh, but the fact is no one gets recruited into mass murder over stuff like that. Those are trifles. Uh, what gets people recruited into mass murder is this ideology that we won't even discuss. And pardon me, but our enemy understands how we can get stuck on stupid. They can exploit that by making those claims or having a hypersensitivity to a, a potential uh, conflict with saying that we are going to profile, we're going to use a profile that, through law enforcement, you analogous to what we've done with the mob. And so what I'm saying is, when you talk about our enemy and how we're not identifying the ideology and the problem, our enemy understands that we're reluctant to do so because of political correctness. Is that true? That's absolutely true. That's the reason why you saw the attack that you saw today. I mean... Crane, think about this. Do you think anybody would have dared attack a United States embassy in Egypt or any place else in the world where we kept an embassy on September 11, 2002, after we had Absolutely demonstrated not. that if you're, going to, if you're going to take that kind of attack with the United States, there were going to be consequences for it? And we seemed, at least for a fleeting time, uh, to be quite clear that we were going to go after terrorists and we were going to treat regimes that aided and abetted terrorists just the same as we t treat those terrorists. And for a while, it looked like we were serious about that. Uh, and there's not a chance in the world that anybody would have dared touch an American embassy on the, on the uh, anniversary of 9-11. I mean, think about what happened today. In Egypt, where a number of 
the hijackers, not the majority of them, but some of them, um, were in fact Egyptian. Uh, so you would think that they would, you know, they'd be a little bit embarrassed about 9-11 to start with. Um, and yet it, they marked 9-11, the day that uh, almost 3,000 of our fellow Americans were savagely killed uh, by Islamic supremacists. They thought today would be just a jolly day to attack the American embassy, pull the flag down, and hang up what has, been, has become uh, infamous in places like Libya and Syria uh, as basically the al-Qaeda flag, the black flag uh, that is uh, emblazoned with the uh, Arabic uh, assertion, uh, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger. Now, why do they dare do something like that today? They do it because they know that they can get away with it, and they know that we're going to respond to it uh, with the sort of fecklessness that we responded to it today, namely uh, the State Department, instead of uh, uh, putting the onus on Islamic supremacism and its, re it, its uh, easy resort to savage behavior, uh, they basically blame the straits we're in on uh, Americans exercising their constitutional rights to make a film that critically examines some aspect of Islam. Now, you know, in the rest of the world, if your religious beliefs or any other part of your belief system that's of importance to you is something that people want to put under a microscope, and examine it for its uh, for it, for its coherence and uh, for, for you know whether it's beneficial or not beneficial. Um, the rest of us are expected to grin and bear it. Uh, we've now basically cut out this exception for Muslims that they're allowed to commit mass murder over it. That's insane. It, it is insane. It also, a flashes up that the U.S. consulate in Libya has been set on fire. Uh, let me ask you, if you were to meet with the president after the first hearing, upon, uh, first hearing about the events in Egypt today, what would you tell him to immediately do? Cancel his, uh, his red carpet invitation to Mohamed Morsi uh, of the Muslim Brotherhood, who was just elected president of Egypt, who we, for some reason, uh, have decided to invite here. Uh, even though we know that the Muslim Brotherhood in the United States, and this is not something is, that's speculation for me, this has been proven in court, uh, Muslim Brotherhood operatives in the United States have said that their mission in the United States is to eliminate and destroy Western civilization from within. That's what their ambition is here. Uh, and we know that in Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood's supreme leader, Mohammed Badi, uh, in 2010, called for violent jihad against the United States. And after the Muslim Brotherhood won the uh, elections in Egypt, uh, he then said that this was the first step to what their ambition has always been, which is the global caliphate, to put everybody uh, under, the, uh, under the dominion of Sharia law. So we know exactly who the Muslim Brotherhood is. We know exactly what they aspire to. Uh, if we allowed ourselves to think about it, we would even understand the ideology that causes them to act. Uh, and rather than treat them like the pariah that they ought to be, uh, we're rolling out the red carpet for this guy. But that's supposed to happen in the next two weeks. So that's something that immediately could be done. Uh, you could also immediately cancel any further financial aid for them. Why we gave them another billion and a half dollars when we knew that that was going basically to what was going to be a Muslim Brotherhood-run government uh, is, is one of the most uh, lunatic things that's been done in American policy in decades. And that's really saying something if you look at some American policy. But at least we could, going forward, tell them the gravy train is over. Haaretz is de reporting that White House has declined Net Netanyahu's, Prime Minister Netanyahu's request to meet with Obama. And uh, th these are the information as it comes in here, Andy. Right. Here's, here's the question, though. In 1982, Muslim Brotherhood, the project, outlines everything we've talked about, as you have highlighted, right. and seen in action, too. We, we, we have the words, we have the action. So we know what they're going to do. What can we do as Americans to make sure that our government at least starts waking up to what we're up against? 
What can we do as individual citizens, Andy? Well, well, I think, Crane, the main thing that we can do is what we're doing right now. I mean, we're, we're in a situation where we've basically had an informational blackout that goes back not to 9-11, but actually goes back to the, uh, to the days of the World Trade Center. I mean, we're talking about this goes back 20 years, the refusal of this government to come to grips with the ideology that, uh, that targets us and to miniaturize the threat against us so that, you know, it, by their depiction of it, uh, you know, we're, there are basically a handful of violent extremist lunatics, and if we could only get them under control, everything else would be fine. And in point of fact, they are the point of a spear, which is, uh, which is an ideology that is entirely mainstream in Islam. It may not be the dominant Muslim, Islam in Europe and the United States, but it's, a, it's certainly got a powerful plurality here, and it is the dynamic Islam of the Middle East. And we need to know that. I mean, if you don't... We need to know it. If Absolutely. If you don't shine a light on it, I don't know what you do. Andrew C. McCarthy, author of Willful Blindness, The Grand Jihad, from the National, Poli- National Review Policy Institute. Thank you for being so generous on today of all days, Andy. We appreciate you. Love you. Thank you for your time.